Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us this evening um, for Taste of Science. We will begin our presentation on Rock and Robin, the movement and song of birds uh, in another a couple of minutes as we uh, let everyone here arrive to our webinar. So thank you for joining us. If you wanna check out more festival events that are coming up, um, you could visit our website, tasteofscience.org. The festival still has another three days to go. So there's still more science to explore. But we'll begin um, tonight's talk shortly. Right. Um, we will give maybe another uh, one moment here for people to join us. <clears throat> My name is Rosemary Puckett, and I am a neuroscientist and uh, an event coordinator for the New York City chapter of Taste of Science. And I'll be your host for tonight's event, which is all about the songs, movement, evolution, and adaptation of birds. Uh, for those of you who are new to Taste of Science, we are part of a national nonprofit science organization um, outreaching to adults. And our mission is to bring the latest research out of the lab and in from the field to share with you, our audience of professional scientists and scientist enthusiasts alike. Because whatever your relationship to science, we're here to help you feed your curiosity at Taste of Science. And usually right about now, we'd be holding big in-person science festival in cities across the United States, inviting you into um, the relaxed atmosphere of bars and cafes. Uh, but to these days, we have the spaces um, in our homes and online, so we've gone digital. And for almost two weeks, our teams in cities across the nation have brought you virtual events on anatomy, evolution, drugs, space, communication, consciousness, community, and more. And there's still some more to come, including tomorrow night on science visualization, Saturday, uh, all about space, which will be in Spanish, and the festival finale on Sunday night. So be sure to check them out at tasteofscience.org. All right, tonight. Tonight's talks were organized by our New York City chapter, and actually the whole team is here backstage. Um, we're watching the Q&A and the Zoom and the chat on Facebook Live. So please ask your, ask your questions to the scientists there. Um, we'll gather them up while you ask during the talk, and um, we'll pose them to our scientists for you after each of their talks. So engage with us. Um, let your curiosity um, drive your question asking and um, 
and let's settle in for two amazing science talks. I'm very excited to introduce our first scientist of the evening, Dr. Julia Zuccello. So Dr. Zuccello is an assistant professor of biology at the College of Mount St. Vincent in the Bronx and a research associate at the American Museum of Natural History. She has been studying starlings to, since 2016 and is interested in their evolution and adaptation over the last 130 years in North America. In addition to their ecological and behavioral habits in the streetscapes of New York City. And in tonight's talk, she's going to discuss the invasion and evolution of these curious adaptive birds um, and their day to day lives in New York City today. So welcome, Dr. Zuccello. Thank you. Thank you so much for the introduction, Rosemary, and thank you to Taste of Science for having me here. Um, so I'm going to share my screen now. Okay. So tonight I really feel privileged to talk about really my favorite topic. Um, and uh, I'm going to be talking about one species of bird, the European starling. Um, and I'll talk about uh, my research, but I also want to start by talking about the history of um, this bird. This is an invasive species in North America, and it has an interesting story um, that leads up to how they arrived here. Um, so I, um, this is what starlings look like in um, the fall, this beautiful bird that you see here. Um, but on the streets of New York, which is where I live, and I watch starlings all the time, um, this is what they look like in the street. So um, the picture on the, the top left is a beautiful photograph showing their iridescent plumage, um, but most times you really don't have the opportunity to see that. And um, basically they're medium sized birds that are dark in color. Um, they're smaller than a pigeon, but larger than a house sparrow. And um, you may have seen them in um, on the sidewalks. Um, they like to uh, eat a lot of food on the street, um, which is how I first uh, became acquainted with them. So um, they also live in many other parts of the United States. So if you're tuning in from any other uh, place besides New York, you may have seen them as well. So they have an interesting story as to how they arrived um, to New York and to North America. So they were brought in 1890 um, to Central Park in New York City. Um, there were about 80 birds that were brought in 1890 um, from Europe to North America, and they were released in Central Park. And um, there's a man named Eugene Shefflin who's responsible for releasing starlings in Central Park. He did this in 1890 and again in 1891. He was part of a group called the American Acclimatization Society, um, which is a, a group that um, brought uh, birds and other uh, animals from Europe to the United States, especially those they thought were useful or beautiful. So they didn't know anything about ecology or conservation. Um, they were kind of aesthetically driven. There's also another uh, piece to this story. And this, this story goes um, that Eugene Shefflin brought them here to the United States because he wanted every bird that was mentioned in Shakespeare to live in Central Park. Now there are some scholars that have um, doubted this that say there's no primary source for this, but it is a good story. So there may be some doubt around the um, Starling Shakespeare connection, but there's no doubt um, that the birds were brought here at that time um, and they became very, very successful after just that one introduction to Central Park in New York. So um, this is a little excerpt from a journal from the American Museum of Natural History in 1906. Um, and I like this little quote from the ornithology curator, um, who's the bird biologist um, at the time. And um, he said that from a bird lover's point of view, the starling is a decided acquisition to the bird life of our cities where it's long drawn cheery whistle is in welcome contrast to the noisy chatter of house sparrows. So house sparrows are the small gray um, and brown birds that we see everywhere in the city. And they were also introduced um, to New York City, to Brooklyn around 1851. So by 1906, um, people were already tired of house sparrows, but the point is that in 1906, starlings were not necessarily viewed as um, something negative yet, even after their introduction um, in 1890. So 
after they were introduced to Central Park, they spread rapidly to um, the United States. Now, you can see that um, by 1960, they made it all the way over to the West Coast. So just from that one introduction, um, which um, is, uh, it, there are about around 100 birds that were introduced there, um, then spread to the entire rest of the United States, including um, Alaska. So they're inhabiting all of these different um, ecosystems throughout the United States, and um, they're able to be successful in their um, expansion and invasion across the United States. So today, just from that one introduction, there are 200 million starlings living in North America. And this map is generated by a citizen science project um, through the Cornell Lab of Ornithology um, called eBird. So there are 200 million birds that all came from that one small population. So they are an invasive species and pe the people have a lot of issues with starlings, which I'll talk about in a moment. Um, but there are also some really um, exceptional and I would say beautiful things about them as well. So they fly in these extremely large flocks called murmurations and there can be up to 100,000 um, birds in these murmurations. And you may have seen this before on, um, on YouTube, um, but it's definitely worth seeing again because it is quite um, a spectacle. So I'll just play a little bit of this video for you um, so you can see the starlings um, in these large flocks, um, kind of these big undulating shapes. Um, some scientists say that the reason why they're flying in these large flocks is to evade a predator. Um, and there are a lot of people studying collective behavior, trying to figure out a little bit more detail as to how they do this. Um, but it's very mesmerizing. And obviously, you know, you could watch this for hours. It's also quite um, calming. So I'll just leave it on for a little bit and then I'll, I'll flip to the next slide. Okay, so, um, so just a little bit about their basic biology there. Um, and uh, so their lifespan is around two to three years. They have a very varied diet. So they eat insects, fruit, and et cetera, I have here, which I will get to um, in, in a few slides. Um, this is probably one of the reasons why they're so successful is because of this dietary um, flexibility. So originally they, um, their native range is in Eurasia and also North Africa, but they were introduced not only to North America, but to South Africa, Australia, New Zealand, and to Argentina. So um, this slide also gives you a, a snapshot of how their plumage changes from season to season. So in the fall and winter, they have um, these little white flecks on their plumage, but those little white flecks um, actually, um, they, uh, they fall off in the spring and summer for the breeding season. And you have a really bright iridescent bird, um, which is trying to attract mates and uh, which you will probably see out there um, on the streets today. The other things are the juveniles, which are these larger, they're large gray birds. Um, and the juveniles will probably be out of their nests in about uh, a week or two um, in, in the parks here. So starlings in general, like I'm talking about one species of starling, the European starling, and that's what my research is about. But just to put it in a little bit of a larger context, this is an evolutionary tree of starlings. Um, and um, there are many different types of starlings throughout the world. Um, this is the, the European starling is the only starling that lives in North America. Many of the starlings that are pictured here are um, birds that live in um, Africa. So the rosy starling, um, the violet back starling and the, um, the superb starling there at the, at the bottom left there. Um, the Stur Sternus unicolor is um, the, the starling, uh, the European starling's closest relative um, and they diverge from uh, each other only about a million years ago. Um, starlings are also very closely related to minor birds um, and they have, as a result, um, they have a really large um, vocal repertoire. So the, the word starling really refers to this big family of birds. Um, but to focus back on specifically on the species that I'm interested in, so this is the now worldwide distribution of just this one species of starling. So you can see that um, they're in many, many different parts of the world, again, um, because they were they were actually introduced. So this is the map and timing of all of the introductions. So they were brought to the United States in 1890, but before that they had been brought to Australia. They were also brought to New Zealand, um, to South Africa and um, to South, uh, South America, to Argentina. 
And many of the motivations for bringing them to these places also were um, acclimatization societies at the time. There's some um, there's some scholars that also point out they were brought to uh, potentially control insect pests. Um, but again, none of the groups that brought them really were thinking about ecology the way we think about ecology today. So what are they doing around the world? So this is the starlings um, feeding behavior that they do um, kind of naturally around the world. They eat um, invertebrates and they stick their beaks in the ground and they do um, this behavior called open bill probing. So they have a very strong muscle on the side of their head and they snap their beak open and closed looking for um, invertebrates in the soil. But they also eat many other things, as I mentioned before. So um, what they're doing across the United States, um, one of the things that they're doing is they eat um, corn uh, that was meant for cows. So there are, there's quite a large um, extensive problem um, with starlings that are eating um, food that's med meant for domesticated animals. So they eat so much food of cows um, that the cows actually produce less milk. Um, so there's, there are a lot of um, control efforts to try and control the starling populations so they're not um, impacting um, domesticated animals. What they're doing here in New York City, so you may have heard of pizza rat, but this is pizza starling. Um, so they really eat, again, a multitude of things on the street. They're not just eating in the parks um, invertebrates. You'll see them eating pizza, bagels, um, you know, pretzels, et cetera. Um, so again, this is one of the reasons why they are so successful um, in the United States, including in urban environments. So they're listed among the world's worst invasive species. They, they also outcompete native birds. They're quite aggressive behaviorally. They also fly into aircraft. Um, they destroy crops um, and they can spread their disease in their guano. They're highly adaptable though. So they have this dietary flexibility and they also have migratory flexibility. Um, so they're not formally a migratory bird, but they can migrate from year to year depending on resource availability. So because of all of these terrible things listed on the slide, um, there are many people who are bird experts or bird enthusiasts who dislike starlings, so much so that this is um, a, a piece that was in uh, Audubon about um, it's okay to dislike some birds and starlings are or the picture that they put up there and they were talking about disliking starlings. So why am I interested in them if they're doing all of these terrible things? Um, well, first of all, ignoring things that are terrible is never a good thing, right? So um, I do think we need to increase the research on this species and not just think about them um, from the perspective of you know hating them and ignoring them. Um, so why should we study starlings? So one of the things that um, I do with my colleagues is um, population genetics. So population genetics can tell you something about the diversity and expansion of a species and can start to inform control efforts and conservation efforts. The other thing that I was really excited about because I'm an evolutionary biologist is that um, when the birds were introduced to all of these different places, they're introduced um, to all of these different ecosystems. So they were kind of inadvertent um, evolutionary experiments, if you will, um, to try and see how a bird would adapt um, in, in different um, environmental contexts. But it's also important to study invasive species, uh, especially with things like climate change and increased human modified landscapes, um, because a bird like a starling might be taking advantage of these increasingly human modified landscapes and spreading even further, um, whereas other native birds um, could be um, hindered by it. So we did this population genetics project. I did, did this together with my colleagues, Louise Bott and um, Leanne Rollins. And there were a few population genetic studies that had been done um, on starlings, one in the United States, but a long time ago. Um, and then there had been mitochondrial um, research done um, in Australia and then in the population in South Africa. So one of the things that we did is we looked at the same genetic region that um, other scientists had looked at in starlings in Australia and South Africa. So we could do a nice comparison of the North American starlings to the Australian starlings and the South African starlings. So first we wanted to figure out genetic diversity of the modern population. Then we wanted to look to see if population structure existed um, in the United States. And then we wanted to compare the US to all of these other populations. So one of the things that I was really interested in is this concept of founder effect. And this is a kind of fundamental concept in population genetics. And if you think of all of the, um, the colored dots here as genetic diversity, when you take a subset of a population, the way the starlings were brought from Europe to the United States, you 
take a subset of their genetic diversity. And so because the population in the United States originated as such a small um, introductory founder population, I wondered if the entire population within the United States had very low um, genetic diversity because of the way they arrived here. So we first looked for um, structure, uh, genetic structure across the United States. So we wanted to know, um, is, is a starling from New York genetically different than a starling from California, for example, especially because of the way they may have spread across the US. Um, so the results here show that um, actually, no, there's not a lot of population structure in the um, starlings throughout the United States. And it probably has to do with the fact that they're flying back and forth and their gene pools are essentially mixing with one another. So there's not a lot of um, distinction between the East Coast and the West Coast, for example. And the other thing is comparing the starlings to other populations. Um, so the size of the circles in this Venn diagram represents how much genetic diversity that population has. We had um, a number of samples from the UK and those birds were um, the most genetically diverse, which is not surprising because this is their native range. And then all of the introduced ranges had um, lower le levels of diversity than the, um, than the original founder population in the UK. We also found very little overlap between the invasive ranges genetically. So North America and Australia overlapped just a little bit genetically, um, but mostly really they were these separate inter introductions and they're separate um, distinct gene pools throughout. So we did find again, lower um, diversity in the um, invasive populations. And one thing um, that I'm showing here is just a comparison of the North American starlings with um, the red-winged blackbird. So the red-winged blackbird um, is a native population of birds within the United States that has a similar population size. So there are 200 million red-winged blackbirds in the US, but they are almost twice as genetically diverse as the starlings are. So um, again, this is just a summary of what we found. No population structure in the US, more diversity in the native range. Um, the native range itself is not fully characterized. That population is actually currently declining. Um, so it would be wonderful to have more specimens from there, but we're not sure that'll be possible. Um, and also, I guess the most important point here is that the low genetic diversity in the starlings in the US is not a barrier to the population expansion. So, so sometimes you think of genetic diversity as low genetic diversity being bad for a population and something where there could be population crashes. Um, but starlings are able to um, be flexible enough, um, probably behaviorally, um, which allows them to, um, to still be a really successful invasive species, even though there's not a lot of diversity. So there's one other part of the, um, the project that I'm doing. Um, so I'm looking at um, not only their genetics, but looking at starling morphology. So what you see here are uh, museum specimens of um, starlings that have been collected um, in the past. And this is one of my favorite pictures. And if you look at the tag there, you see that this bird is from uh, March 30th, 1890. And this is in the American Museum of Natural History's wonderful collection. And so it enables us um, to look at change through time by looking at these museum collections. And uh, the museum collection has uh, every decade since 1890 represented um, for, for starlings. So we're able to look through time to try and see, do we see any morphological changes um, occurring um, through time? So this is me, I've gone to different museums, AM&H also um, Natural History Museum in England um, to Tring. This is what the birds look like in the museum tray. And you can see some of them have their flecked pattern on them and others are in their um, breeding plumage. And so what are we doing with these specimens? Well, we're um, taking some really basic measurements, uh, measuring the beak length, the wing length, um, the tail and the tarsus. And again, just looking at these things through time. And um, we've collected many, many different um, specimens at this point. Again, all of the same species. We have like over um, 1,400 bird skins um, that we've looked at. And I'm also working together with the US Department of Agriculture. Um, and they have included more birds into this, um, this sample as well. So we're looking at modern birds, but also historical specimens from the museum. So what are the types of things that we're finding? So there's. Um, so first we're, yeah, we're, we're looking at um, beak length, body size, wing length, um, and we want to know if there are differences through time, but also differences between the invasive and the native populations. Um, so this is, these are 
two starlings. Um, these images are from eBird. Um, so again, citizen science, citizen scientists just um, upload photographs that they take of birds. And I don't know how they got these beautiful photos because every time I try and take a photo, they, um, they fly away from me. But um, one of the things that you see is the bird on the left is from Arizona and the bird on the right is from England. And so um, this gives a clue of some of the preliminary evidence that we're finding. And we're seeing a difference in beak length um, in the birds that are from the United States versus those from the native range. So what might this mean? Um, so we don't know yet. It's really preliminary. I'm excited to kind of pursue this further. Um, but perhaps the change in beak length in the U.S. could relate to this very specific um, diet because they are um, eating all of this food at farms. There are obviously farms in the U.K. as, as well, um, but not in the density that we see um, within the United States. So perhaps they are adapting um, just from having been here from 1890 to um, today. So one of the last things that I'll say is that um, I'm continuing this research and um, hoping to work together with some students at um, the college that I'm working at. And I'm really excited to explore more about the urban ecology aspect of it. Specifically that starlings are the birds that you see not only in parks, but also on the street. Whereas um, there are many, many different birds that live only the, in the park. So in Central Park now, um, if you're a bird person, which you might be, which is why you're joining, um, it is, um, it's spring migration. And there are many, many different birds that are migrating through New York City and they pass by and they temporarily stop in Central Park. So there are two warblers that are pictured here um, and also a woodpecker. And then a few weeks ago, there was the snowy owl. So there are a lot of birds, there's a lot of bird diversity in the parks, but it's quite different than the birds that are on the street. And so starlings are part of these birds that are on the street. So I'm interested in um, quantifying some of this um, diversity that is, um, that is separated out um, just by these kind of micro landscapes that are created um, within New York City. So um, here's the summary of the work that we've done. Um, again, this low genetic diversity is not a barrier to their expansion. They, um, they they're very adaptable to different food sources. Um, and we need to think more about this, especially with increasingly human modified landscapes and agricultural expansion. Um, and the other last thing that I, I will say is that you can learn a lot from trash birds. Um, so there are many people who, again, don't like starlings, um, but I've definitely learned a lot and there's, and there's more to explore because of their unique population history. So I look forward to um, continuing this research. And um, many, many people have participated in this um, and have been wonderful um, colleagues and my mentees um, who've worked together with me on this project. So obviously I could not have done it alone. Um, here are some of my mentees um, at the American Museum of Natural History. I worked with the Science Research Mentoring Program. Um, and then this is um, my last slide and there should be some audio with this. Let me see. So if you listen very carefully, um, there should be some audio where you can hear a starling um, vocalizing. So thank you so much and thanks for having me. I'm happy to take questions. All right. Thank you so much. That was, um, I'm just, I'm smiling listening to those starlings because I feel like I pass them and I hear them and I'm always so captivated by them. Um, it's really exciting to learn more about their history and why we see them everywhere. So thank you for that enlightening talk. Um, uh, vis uh, audience at home, uh, please share um, your questions for Julia. So if you're watching on Facebook Live, you can put them in the chat. Uh, if you're on Zoom, uh, joining us on Zoom, you can put them in the Q&A function and um, we're collecting them. And I'm gonna go ahead and start uh, posing them here to Julia. So one of the things uh, that people are interested in is the differences uh, between urban populations of starlings and rural populations. So are there any differences and could you talk more about them? 
Yeah. So one of the really um, challenging things about answering that question is that, uh, you know how I mentioned that there's no population structure throughout the United States. And so um, it's, it's very um, difficult to figure out if there are birds that are living in one specific area that are just urban birds and that are not um, spending at least some time in a more rural environment. So there are some studies that had been done where basically you have to ban the birds and track them to try and figure out where they're going throughout the year. Um, and instead of migrating um, north and south the way migratory birds normally do, um, they, they have some erratic uh, movements where they go east and west. And um, so it's difficult to figure out, are you, are you an urban star? Are you just a New Yorker starling? That's what I want to know. And, and um, you know, or, or are you going to other places? And I think the answer is they're probably going to a lot of different uh, places. So it, it's been hard in our work to try and figure out, um, like, you know, with the lack of population structure, it's, it's kind of hard to figure out where they are. But really what you need to do is a, is a large scale kind of banding, um, which people do digitally now, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, speaking of the migratory um, sort of aspect of this, someone is wondering if the populations of starlings in New York City are affected by the migratory populations that come through in the spring and the fall. Mm, that's a really good question. I do not know the answer to that. Um, and I think one of the ways to get at that question would be to um, yeah, you'd have to study them, you know, within these time periods where there is migratory birds um, in Central Park and figure out if the starlings are doing anything different. Um, yeah, I mean, the other question is, are, this, are the migratory birds affected by the starlings, right? Because the starlings are the ones that are very aggressive. Um, and then there are these passers-by that are not native New Yorkers. They don't know how to, you know, um, they're probably not as aggressive. Um, but yes, that's a great question. And I don't know the answer. And I think that kind of gets to this, um, this idea that it, you, we need to explore these little kind of mi micro landscapes within um, the urban world. Yeah, it sounds like we can learn a fascinating amount because we've got all of these sort of natural experiments going on. Yeah. And, and those other, the, the, the other New Yorker, the non-New Yorker birds don't know how to tell them to get off the sidewalk. And oh. there's a lot of great jokes. Um, we are also wondering though about the seasonality of starling behaviors. So is there a seasonality or any other pattern to say when the starling murmurs occur or any of those other things that we- Yeah, yeah so the murmurations um, occur primarily in the fall. Um, and there are people who go to uh, like actually watch them. A lot of people who are photographers uh, are really interested in capturing them. Um, there's a lot of, there are a lot of people also unsurprisingly in, uh, in the UK doing that because the starlings are not hated in quite the same way because they're native populations. So um, going to look for starling murmurations in the fall um, in, in the UK is something that, um, that happens a lot and it's kind of like a kind of destination. So that's one seasonal behavior. The other thing is that um, right now is their um, breeding season. And so they, uh, their, their vocal repertoire, and maybe Jacob could speak more to this, um, their vocal repertoire now is trying to attract mates. And so the males have uh, a real um, sort of peak in the diversity of sounds that they make trying to attract mates. And then in about uh, a few weeks, uh, you'll see the babies that are, um, that are out in the nest. So there's, you know, a bunch, not just from that mating, but from before too. Um, you'll see the um, juvenile starlings that are out um, right around, yeah, kind of, kind of like May. Um, and you know, that's the, that's the time where um, you'll see these kind of gray birds. And what's amazing about them is they're, they're, the juveniles are quite large. They're almost the same size as the parents. Um, and they're like cheeping wildly and they, they want their parents to give them food. And so you'll see like a pair of starlings, like again in May, um, where they're trying to get food for their, for their young and the young's out of the nest kind of uh, cheeping wildly at them. So that's definitely something to, that's definitely a seasonality to, to the, the behavior. Are they are they a mate for life species or I have no no every yeah, season something? Um, one more question about those murmurs: Do they? You said they occur in the fall very often. Are there particular environments where they do it, or could you see them sort of anywhere start murmuring? Right. So I've never seen them here in the city, and you really need big sky, obviously. Um, 
And again, why are they doing this? Um, so some of the, some of the, you know, some people have said that one of the reasons why they're doing this is to evade a predator. So sometimes when you see them doing the murmuration, you can see a larger bird of prey um, that they're trying to evade. Um, but other people have said, you know, they're trying to evade them. It's like trying to run away from someone, but doing ballet. Like you're like, that's not the most efficient way to run away from someone, <laughs> you know? So there's maybe something else to their behavior um, than just evading the, the predator. But I feel like there all there always is. We yeah. have our human first instinct and there's probably always more in their starling world. Do we know um, which bird species that they're displacing or affecting the most? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so someone, so um, one of the, uh, so bluebirds are one of the species. Um, so not blue jays, um, but bluebirds. Um, but there's also been research on this showing mixed results. So the, the thing that people always just say about starlings is they're, they're out competing native birds, um, but then people have done research trying to quantify that and it's actually not always clear. Um, partially also because they've already invaded all of these ecological niches. And so whenever whenever they were out competing and their displacing has, has already happened um, and they've just been established here for so long. So it's not that you'll see necessarily um, a change or, or something that's being affected now. I mean, I know a lot of people who've told me, you know, at at bird feeders, for example, you can see their aggressive behavior towards uh, to many other local species. And so again, that's why people who are uh, bird level lovers are like, ah, get the starling away from the bird feeder because they just they just will be, um, they'll, they'll peck at other birds. They also um, they also compete for nest space. So they, they, are, they like to nest in trees and they kick other birds out of their nests um, so, they can, so they can nest in trees, so. Oh yeah, very aggressive. It sounds like citizen science is a really helpful um, sort of avenue for starling research too, since people are reporting their observations in about behavior in all these places. Yeah, I know. It's quite amazing, I have to say. I mean, the Cornell group of ornithology is amazing. And, you know, they have a citizen, citizen science project, which extends way beyond starlings. Um, but uh, in, what's interesting to me is that obviously there are people who are interested in starlings who are recording their, um, recording their locations and taking photographs. Um, so right, and and because it's such a widespread species and it's so dense, the population throughout the United States, like you, one individual couldn't do that. So you do need um, citizen science scientists mm -hmm. throughout the world. We have a couple more great questions. Um, do we know? Are there any efforts to control the starling populations? Yeah, so um, there are efforts from the U.S. Department of Agriculture every year within the United States. Um, and there are um, around 2 million starlings that are killed every year um, as part of the control effort. And the thing is, it sounds terrible, but it actually doesn't really put a dent in their population because it's so, um, because their populations are so large. And, um, you know, uh, but, but again, uh, on a kind of economic scale, it causes a big problem at farms um, and the, these large scale dairy farms, as I showed, um, and so it, it is. It is quite a big, um, you know, economic problem. And um, and there are these control efforts. And part of the control efforts um, are also trying to figure out uh, the best way to control the starling. So even um, like poisoning them, and you know, kind of all this kind of creativity on that end of it, um, trying to figure out how to um, to to call the population successfully because they're so they're so um, you know again uh, adaptable and and quite clever really. So. Mm -hmm. um, last couple questions, and these are actually about techniques with genetics, and then one genetic um, theoretical question I love. So one question is, would it be possible to use microbial DNA to see if there are differences in starlings from different cities? Is it even possible to elucidate microbial DNA from them? Yeah, so I think um, are, you might be talking about kind of microbiomes. I think I am, yes, yes, uh, yeah. yes. Yeah, so um, that's a great question. Um, I think, so one of the things that I've thought about doing, so it's hard to do that, like looking at, so the bird skins that I look at in the museum, for example, you can't use those because they've been sitting in a drawer in a museum. And so there's like too many contaminants. Um, if you, you're, you're not gonna get the microbial signature of the bird when it was alive. Um, but something that might be possible is looking at birds uh, where they're fresh specimens, where the you know populations have just been culled, and comparing um, the the microbiome like in the stomach or or something you know where you can dissect the bird and then can and compare it, um, trying to figure out what, you know what they're eating. Um, but 
but again, it would be, it's hard to do it on the kind of surface of, of the bird, but yeah, it's, it's a good question. Does the fact that there's little genetic diversity, like very low genetic diversity across the United States mean there's actually little selective pressure on the species? There's less selective pressure? Yeah, that's a great question too. So it's actually a perfect system to look for signatures of natural selection because um, you know, there's not a lot of variation. So if you do see se selection in one, um, in, in one population, you would actually see kind of like a genetic peak, if you will, um, that you could then uh, figure out if that is um, selection. So um, there's someone at Cornell named Natalie Hoffmeister who's done some work looking um, at whole genomes of um, starlings across the United States and found some evidence for um, selection related to um, uh, like temperature adaptation in certain areas throughout the United States. So, um, so it, yeah, again, it's a great question. And I think more work needs to be done there, um, especially because the genetic background is so homogenous. So therefore the kind of peaks of selection would be um, easier to, to find. To pull out of the so last question, um, and it's it's kind of, it's a nice theoretical question, I think, as well. So um, with this lack of genetic variability in an introduced species, when you were talking about the founder effect, would that be similar to what we would see maybe in a human population that was introduced on another planet? Is that the same mechanics? Yeah, so it's what you see in human populations that are on this planet, actually. Um, and um, so, you know, Homo sapiens, our species originated within Africa, then um, populations, subpopulations moved outside of Africa, and then subpopulations of that continued to migrate and continue to migrate. So what we have in humans is called, we have a serial founder effect, um, where um, population um, genetic diversity declines as you move with increasing distance outside of Africa. And so obviously humans uh, move around, um, but not as much actually as birds. Um, and so, uh, so actually even today, you still see a signature of the founder effect um, that I just described in, in human population. So you actually don't even need to go to another planet. <laughs> This, that's so fascinating. Thank you so much for sharing that research. Thank you for answering all of our questions um, and at least making me think more deeply when I see those bright iridescent captivating birds on, yeah. on the sidewalk and in the trees. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Rosemary, and to everyone out there. Um, so uh, as we transition uh, between speakers here, um, one of our traditions when we're gathered in bars and coffee shops is actually to present the audience um, between talks with a fun science related activity. And we're honoring that tradition tonight with a game that was crafted just for this event. So it's a bird themed puzzle that you can try after the talks are over. Um, we'll drop a link in the chats uh, to a game card that's full of pictures that are related to the names of some favorite well-known birds. So I'll show you here what the game card looks like. Um, so you'll, you, you'll find here the instructions and then two columns. Um, if you um, combine one image from each column, uh, you'll get visual clues that will lead you to the name of a common bird. So Tony Hawk here and the tomahawk will lead you to the hawk. And there are letters you'll find below each clue. If you arrange those next to the bird, um, that, that, clue is referencing, eventually you will spell out and reveal our secret phrase. Uh, and you can follow the directions at the bottom and email the correct secret phrase to us at New York Taste of Science uh, by Monday, this Monday. And we'll do a drawing from the correct submissions and mail out some pretty sweet uh, Taste of Science swag. Um, so we have all sorts of wonderful Taste of Science, you know cool things that we might send you in the mail, keychains and, and exciting um, things to thank you for joining us here. So um, to now present our second speaker, I'm very excited to introduce Jacob Edwards. Jacob is a graduate student of psychology and a researcher in Columbia University's Zuckerman Mind Brain Behavior Institute, which I love. 
Uh, he's most fascinated by how the tiny bundles of water, fat, and electricity inside each of our heads, our beautiful neurons, unite to produce a thinking, feeling, and expressive self. And as a PhD student in Dr. Sarah Woolley's lab at Columbia University Psychology, Jacob studies songbirds to understand how, understand how the sounds they grow up hearing actually shape the songs they sing as adults. Uh, in tonight's talk, he'll share his work from the lab, linking the sense of hearing in the brain to early life experiences and song production in adults. And he'll ponder the forces that set boundaries on what is possible to learn at all. So Jacob, thank you so much for joining us. All right, thank you. So I'll go ahead and share my screen. Um, let's see. Okay, does this look good? Yes. Okay, great. All right, so I'll, I'll dive right into what I'm calling landscapes of learning what birds hear and what they sing. Um, thanks for the great intro, Rosemary, and uh, I'm really honored to be sharing some of my work here with you. Um, thanks for the invitation uh, to the whole Taste of Science team. Um, and thanks, Julia, for the great talk before. Um, and all right, so. There we go. Okay. Yeah. So like Rosemary said, I'm uh, just entering my third year of PhD studies in the Department of Psychology here at Columbia. We're also part of the Zuckerman Institute um, for Mind, Brain, and Behavior. And I'm in Dr. Sarah Woolley's lab and sort of the informal name for our lab is the Communication Neuroscience Lab. And the overarching goal of what we're interested in is how does sound that we produce with our vocal cords become an idea. And this, you know, in humans, we call this language and, and language is so special and so powerful. You know, our civilization wouldn't exist without it. Um, and there's something sitting in between these two, you know, steps, which is the brain. Um, so our big question overall is how does the brain extract meaning from sound? Um, and so, you know, there's, there's lots of fascinating aspects here. Uh, but one thing that's incredible about language or what I'll call learned vocal communication um, is that it's really rare. It's really rare and unusual. Um, so let's just look at a, this is a family tree of all animals, all living vertebrates. It's just sort of a coarse family tree. And, um, you know, it, most animals make some kind of sound. You know, your, your dogs bark, your cats meow, um, but there's no real learning. And, you know, maybe that means something, but, uh, you know, cat meowing for dinner is not that different from the cat meowing when he wants to scratch on his back. Um, but this type of learned vocal communication is, has only evolved really three times that we know of. Uh, once, of course, in humans, um, another time in whales and dolphins, and then a uh, third time in songbirds. So uh, this guy right here is a zebra finch, and he has become, over the past 50 years or so, maybe a little longer, uh, sort of the workhorse model system for understanding uh, bird song. We know more about zebra finches uh, in, in the bird song neuroscience context than just about any other bird. Um, and so a, a video is worth a thousand pictures. So I'm just going to show you what what this learned vocal communication looks like in these zebra finches. Okay, so here, here's a family. Here's baby on the left. Um, mom is over here on the right side, and dad is here in the middle. He's got, you can tell because he's got this, these orange cheek patches, and this is zebra bib. That's uh, how they get their name, the zebra finch. And so dad just got home from a long day at, at work, and uh, he's going to tell them about about his day. So here, listen in. Oh, I just got to make sure I'm sharing my sound. Okay. If you don't hear this, let me know. Okay, so we may not ever know exactly what they were talking about there, but there was certainly an exchange of information among these birds. 
And so let, let me just highlight really quickly. I'll go back to this particular segment here and listen carefully to this guy. So that right there was a song. Uh, probably not the bird song you're used to hearing, uh, but in zebra finches, that's what it sounds like. And so let me show you. Uh, let's dive deeper into what that song is. So if, if I recorded from this bird, and here's, here's what that song sounded like. Um, what the song looks like. So this is an audio waveform. You've probably seen these before. It just shows you how loud the sound is uh, over time. And this is nice, but um, we use a, a, a different way of visualizing the sound that uh, shows us a lot of interesting structure in the sound. And with, with just a little bit of math, we can represent the sound in a different way. Uh, it's called a spectrogram, and it looks like this. OK, so this is the same sound. Uh, so I have time on the x-axis here, and on the y-axis is frequency, which we perceive as pitch. So going up on the y-axis is, is uh, sounds with higher pitch, and down is sounds with lower pitch. And the, the intensity of the color tells you how much uh, sound energy is in a particular frequency band. So these sort of high, uh, these sort of like really bright notes with um, a lot of energy in this high frequency, we perceive that as a high pitch, and the, the lower notes um, are down lower, and we, we perceive that as a lower pitch. So it's the same sound as above, but what we can see is, is the, the frequency structure. And, and you'll notice a couple things. One, so the time scale is in seconds here. So this is three seconds of recording from this bird. So he's, that's a pretty short time, and he's packed a lot of information into a short time. Um, and, and the structure in terms of frequency is very rich. So you'll notice that a, a bunch of his syllables, we call them syllables, uh, have frequencies in many different um, bands stacked on top of each other. That's called a harmonic. It's, it's just like a, a harmonic chord in, in music. Um, and it gives the sound sort of a, a nice timber to it. Okay, so let me play it for you and you're gonna notice something else about the rhythm of this song. So if you listen to it, you, you notice that he sort of repeats the same thing over and over. And, and you can kind of see that repeating uh, rhythm in, in the spectrogram here. Um, okay, so, so this is a way of visualizing sound and I'll show you plenty of these so you'll get used to them quickly. All right, so this came from an adult male zebra finch. And this guy, this particular guy had a whole bunch of children, uh, sons and daughters, and we, we, we reared them slightly differently. So here is a, a recording from one of his sons who listened to his dad. He copied his song pretty nicely. So here's what his son's song looks like. And you can see it's pretty similar. And if you listen to it again, I'll play it for you. It sounds pretty similar. He makes a good copy, um, and he's still got that nice rhythm to it. And just to drive home that he, he made a, a good copy, I'll just highlight a couple syllables here. So here's check out this note in Dad's song. The same note is present in his son's song. And there are a few things missing. There are a few slight changes. So you don't want to sound just like your dad. Uh, you can improvise a little bit. Um, but okay, so so here is one of his sons, and this guy had a, a brother too, and the brother we reared, we we took the egg out of the nest before he heard anything, and we raised him with his mother and his sisters, and in this particular species, only the males sing. So this guy grew up never hearing a song before ever, and he tries, he tries to do something but it's not that great. Here's what his spectrogram looks like. And you'll notice right off the bat that it's missing the richness, the, the rich structure of, of the, the songs above. And let me play it for you now. See, so it's kind of noisy. That's what these uh, sort of longer syllables are. It's a little noisy, it's high pitch. Um, it doesn't have a nice, a nice rhythm to it. Um, it almost sounds like he's struggling. So we call this isolate song. And so 
we have some different outcomes here, depending on your experience in early life. And, um, you know, one takeaway is that you, if you're going to learn a good song, you need a teacher, you need some kind of input. And so this sets me up to talk about the idea of landscapes um, in, in the context of learning. So uh, I'll tell you about this metaphor that I really love. So there was a, a really brilliant cell biologist uh, in the 1950s uh, around that time. His name was Conrad Waddington. And uh, he, was a, he was a cell biologist. He was interested in um, cell differentiation, gene expression, you know, how does a stem cell become a liver cell and not a kidney cell? How does it know what to do? Um, and so he came up with this metaphor called a, what he called an epigenetic landscape. Um, and I think it fits our situation perfectly. So I'll talk about it in our context. So he imagined that, you know, let's say you're a cell or, or, or a human, a baby human or a baby zebra finch. You start off as a little marble at the top of this hill, and you're on a landscape of possibilities of what you could become later on. And so at the beginning, you start rolling down this hill, and you might reach, say, a, a critical juncture here where, where you're susceptible to something in the environment or some genes or what have you. And depending on what you experience, you might go down a, one, of, one of two pathways here, a pathway on the left or the pathway on the, on the right. And depending on which pathway you, you take at this juncture, that's going to determine what pathway you take at later junctures. Okay, so imagine if you're a, a, zebra, a baby zebra finch and you get no auditory input as a, as a young hatchling, you might end up on a totally different pathway than you would if you got some auditory input. Um, and so I'll flesh this out in a little bit further. Uh, but, but Waddington wanted to understand how, how, do we, how do we know, how do we understand about the forces that shape this landscape? What is it that controls the shape, the hills and the valleys? And he thought, well, maybe we could look at it. So pick up the landscape like a sheet and look underneath it. And he imagined that there would be these pegs that are embedded in some substrate down here and they're connected by these guy wires to the to the landscape and the guy wires pull and and relax and control the shape of the landscape that the cell or the you know young zebra finch moves through over its lifetime and so he thought of these things as genes and their protein products that all interact to shape the development of the organism um, but i think we could this metaphor applies to many situations and we could think of these things as maybe neurons in the brain that you know that all act together to produce a perception and then the way that they act together you know determines your your pathway through uh through life okay so uh, let, let, i'll il illustrate this a little bit further so my question is what is the song learning landscape so imagine you're a, a a baby zebra finch here, you start at the top of the hill, you get going down one pathway and, and you get some auditory input from your from your dad and you end up going down this to this location on the landscape and you make a good song. So let's imagine at this at this juncture, this critical juncture, you you don't get auditory input. You end up with an isolate song. Okay. Well, there's another really interesting possibility. What if you get some auditory input, but it's not from your own species? So this is something we do in the lab. It's called cross tutoring, where we take the eggs of a zebra finch or some other bird and put them in the nest of a different bird, of a different species that sings a different type of song. Uh, this is called cross tutoring. And what happens is really incredible. So we take a bird, a young bird that's up here, he's susceptible, he has many pathways open to him and let him learn something totally new and he'll produce a very, very different type of song that's pretty close to the species that he was raised by. So we, we can shift their, the pathways that they take during development. Um, okay, so let's, let's dive into this because it's not a perfect copy. There's still something inherently zebra finch about this. And so let's have a look at that. Uh, so this is a, here's a, here's a Bengalese finch. Um, 
And they're, they're pretty closely related to the zebra finches. They're about the same size. They sing, the, sing a similar type of song. So here's just two examples. Here's two different Bengalese finches that we use as tutors, uh, which is what we call the bird that teaches another bird a song. Um, and you can see that they've, uh, what they do, one of their defining features is that they sing these really short notes really fastly or really quickly. And uh, they, they repeat the same note in, in a, a trill for you know, some number of times, five to eight times. So here's the same note, one, two, three, four, five times. Um, then they'll do this one twice. And here he does it what, seven times on the bottom. Um, okay, so what we did is we, we used these Bengalese finches as tutors. Uh, we took the eggs of zebra finches and put them in the nest of the Bengalese finches. They raised them. And then so these zebra finches learned how to sing or learned from the Bengalese finches. And this is what their songs looked like. So it's not bad. They've copied a lot of the notes. You can look, look at these sort of ladder structures. Um, you can see those in, in, the, in the tutors over here. Uh, but if you, if you notice, you can see these sort of repeating elements. Um, and it, especially in the bottom one, notice this sort of like long noisy thing followed by a five note, six note, First, he repeats these same things over and over. It's the zebra finch rhythm. So he takes the Bengalese notes and puts them on top of a zebra finch tempo. Um, so there's, so there's something that he can't quite escape. He can't make a perfect copy. There's some limitation here. Um, and that is what we're really interested in. I think this is super fascinating. Um, so back to the idea of landscapes, you take a zebra finch, raise him by Bengalese finches. We pushed him in the direction of the Bengalese finch, but, but he can't quite make it. So there's some boundary here that's insurmountable. There's some constraint that, that he just can't push himself over. Um, so this is sort of motivating my, my current project. And you know, the question then becomes, what are, what are the pegs in this illustration? Um, they're probably neurons, that's what I think, or something about the brain. And, and so we want to know what, what is it about neurons or about the brain that is uh, imposing this limitation on what the bird is able to copy. Um, okay. So how do we get there? Um, this is sort of part of my PhD project, and this is a work in progress. So unfortunately, I'm not going to have you know, a super satisfying answer for you, but, but this will be interesting nonetheless. Uh, OK, so I'm, I'm looking at, at five different species right now. And we're going to record from their auditory neurons. We play them all types of songs. Um, these are the species we're looking at. Zebra finches up here, long-tailed finch, double-barred finch, Bengalese finch, gold-breasted waxbills. No need to keep these straight. Um, I'll give you little icons when I'm talking about a particular one. But um, you know, we pick these because we know that they're, they're related uh, to each other in varying amounts. Um, and, and the songs that they produce are really different from each other. Uh, so now as trained spectrogram readers, you can see uh, how vastly different these songs are. So the goal is to tease apart, you know, what is it that certain species are tuning into? Um, what, what is it about the acoustics, uh, about their neurons that shapes the landscape that they're capable of, of perceiving and copying um, or learning? Um, okay, so that's the idea and we need to go into the brain. So let me show you, uh, I won't spend a lot of time on this, but I just wanna show you what the bird brain looks like, or at least the auditory part of it. Uh, so here, here on the left is, is stained tissue, and on the right is a schematic diagram. We're looking at sort of the, the back half of the brain back here. Um, and this is all, these are all uh, regions that contain neurons that, that respond to sound. Um, this, this area right here, uh, L1, L2A, L3, L2B, it's called the field L complex. So interestingly, when people first were naming regions of the bird's brain. They just started at the top of the alphabet and then went down. So region A, area B, field L. Um, some of these talk like field L. There's, the coolest one is area X, which isn't in this picture. But um, 
So this is what it looks like. And basically there's a lot of subregions in the auditory cortex that we know uh, they each do different things and um, certain interesting properties arise in different regions. So even though this looks weird, I, just as a quick aside, I, I wanna emphasize that a lot of evidence from many different fields, um, from you know patterns of connectivity to uh, you know hormone expression, gene expression, uh, what else? Properties of neurons. All the evidence is pointing to the songbird brain having being very very similar to the human brain. Um, we used to think that it was missing a lot of parts, mainly the cortex, which is in green here. But, but our updated view now, all the evidence is pointing that birds have a cortex just like ours. It just looks different. Um, but functionally, it's very, very similar. So if you're interested in this, um, I'd, I'd Google the name Eric Jarvis. He's done a lot of work on this question and uh, has, has synthesized a lot of interesting research also. So that would be a good starting point. Um, Okay, so we're going to go into the brain and, and record from neurons and see what they're capable of encoding. And here's how we do it. So um, we have these, uh, it's called an electrode. It's a, it's a metal, um, it looks like a fork. It has these four shanks. It's super, super, super small. It's tiny. You can barely see it with the naked eye and very, very thin. And it has uh, up to 32 little sites on it that are uh, conductive contacts that we can use to listen in to eavesdrop on the electrical activity of neurons. And so I paint it with a fluorescent dye and then I very slowly, very gently lower it into the brain of, uh, of a bird. And this probe is connected to a rig here that's connected to a computer. Um, and so I basically make a circuit between the computer and the brain. And uh, while that's all set up, um, I play hundreds of different sounds, natural sounds like the songs of many different species, uh, synthetic sounds that help us tease apart um, certain acoustic uh, features like pitch, the you know density of the harmonic stacking, uh, the timing, you know how how quickly is sound changing. Um, so we use lots and lots of different stimuli. Uh, and then what we're looking for are, you may have heard of these, they're called action potentials or spikes that look like this. So um, the, the curve here is the, the current or, or the, sorry, the voltage. It's the electrical potential that we're picking up. And when a neuron fires off, when it discharges, there's a huge uh, change in the electrical potential that comes back to baseline. And so that's called a spike. And this is the language of the brain, the pattern of spikes. Every thought, every feeling, every memory, everything you've loved is a pattern of spikes. <laughs> so think about that sometime. Um, all right, so that's what we're looking for. Um, and let me just show you what uh, what happens mid recording. And if you if you have volume, try to listen to this. Uh, if not, you can just watch this sort of yellow trace on the computer. So I've got uh, I'm looking at one recording channel here. So I've got one neuron on on this channel, and um, the the yellow line here is sort of the incoming data. And, and it's a it's a waveform, so we can play it back as sound, and we can listen to it. And if you listen to it, it sounds kind of like popcorn when the when nothing's going on, um, and then when the cell gets really activated, you'll you'll hear it just burst off. So let me play this. So see there, it loves that. Okay, so that's the, the raw data coming in, and I, I can record from many, many neurons at once, uh, 32 here in this case. Um, <clears throat> and this goes on for a while, and um, much, much later, an, an eternity of data processing has to happen before we get these signals into a nice format that is somewhat interpretable. Um, so I'll skip 
all of these nitty gritty details for now. Um, and sort of the culmination of all of the processing work gives us something like this. Uh, okay, so this is a, because I've been very careful about where I put the probe, um, I can figure out exactly where it was, you know, just the 3D coordinates of, of where the neuron was I was recording from. Um, I convert its electrical activity into a um, what we call a firing rate. It's how many spikes per second the neuron fires at. Um, we align everything back to the stimuli it heard. So there's a lot of work that goes into these, uh, but but it's really beautiful. So here here's um, a 3D plot of the brain. So this comes this all comes from one bird, and each dot here is a neuron, and the size of the dot is its firing rate. It's a measure of its activity. So if the dot is big, the cell is really firing like crazy. If it's small, the cell is being quiet. And so here's a, here's a, a spectrogram of a double barred finch song. And this actually, these cells came from a double barred finch. So this is, uh, this isn't his song, but the neurons are listening to the song of their own species. And I'm going to play this. This song is about five seconds long, and I'm going to go through it really slow. So keep that in mind that all this is happening super fast. All right. Oh, and the line here shows you the sound. So when sound is on, there's these little humps in the line. Okay, this is the brain in action. Um, all right, so you can see that there are, there's a diversity of responses here. Some cells love these sounds, some cells don't really give a, a blip about them. Um, I find this visualization super satisfying, so maybe we can just, I'll show you one more. Um, this is a, a zebra finch song, same neurons as before, so sound on. These cells take a little bit to get worked up. There we go. They're, now they're loving it. Okay, so I'll pause that there. Um, all right, so I think these are really nice. These are they're cool visualizations, but. You know, if we're going to do science on this, we want to. We need some sort of quantity that we can compare between species, uh, and we need a, 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 you know, a way to really measure differences in the responses here. So it's kind of where what I'm working on now. But I'll, I'll show you a sort of a course first step. So what if we just take, let's say for each species, we just take the average firing rate of all the cells, and so we'll have, you know, a measure that's for the average neuron of a zebra finch, what's its response to a stimulus? And so that's what I'll show you here. So take all these cells and take the average response. Um, okay, so let's, we'll look at it against this song. So I have three curves here on the, on the plot below the spectrogram. Um, the orange is the zebra finch, the blue is the Bengalese finch, and the purple is the double barred finch. And you'll see places where they overlap. And so they're, they're all normalized, so they're comparable here. And you can think of this line as the average neuron in, for each species. Um, so there, there are parts where they you know, are overlap or they show a similar pattern. Um, but there are parts, uh, I'll point out too here, where the zebra finch in orange and the double barred finch in purple, they really love this note. But the Bengalese finch in blue doesn't care at all about this note right here. You could think of this as like, the bird doesn't even perceive this. It doesn't register it. Um, same thing. Here's the same note down here. We get the same pattern. The Bengalese finch, the blue line. No response to this note at all. Um, <laughs> so here's another example. Uh, this is a, a long-tailed finch song. Uh, same, same uh, uh, curves here, and let me point out um, two things. One, if you if you look at the blue curve on the left side, you'll notice that 
the Bengalese finch cells lose interest in these types of notes pretty quickly. Um, and then especially what stands out to me is the purple response is the, the double barred finch. Something about these notes he really loves that the other species do not care about at all. So these are the kinds of, of differences that we're looking for. And um, you know, even in a very coarse metric like this, we just take the average activity of the brain. Um, something's already popping out that there, there's something about the acoustics of this song that, that, uh, that triggers something in, in this species, but not the others. Um, so the next steps are to, to really dissect out what, you know, what is special about these notes that produce these differences uh, in responses and, you know, where do these differences show up? We'll look definitely at a, at a you know, the different regions of the brain. We know a lot about the cell types um, in the brain. So there's a lot of dissecting to do, um, but I think we're, we've, we've, all is not lost here. So, um, okay. So I'll wrap up and just leave you with some final things to think about as you're walking about listening to birds singing. Um, one is, as a bird, how do you learn the right song? And this is the same as asking as a human, how do you learn the right language? Um, so it's definitely a combination of experience and I think this idea of boundaries and your, the landscape of possibilities for you can keep you within your species range or your cultural range, but it allows some individual flexibility. It allows you to experiment to improvise and perhaps become outstanding. Um, and then the obvious question is what are the boundaries? What sets them? Um, and is it ever a good idea to cross them, um, if ever? Maybe so. All right, so that's, I'll wrap up there and I'll just say thanks uh, to the Woolly Lab, both past and present, to my advisor, Sarah, um, all my lab mates, and especially uh, to Jordan Moore, who's taught me a lot. Um, and a big thank you to you for listening and having me here. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jacob. Um, that had two things that I always love in a talk, which is a good scientific metaphor. And um, neurons lighting up in action in response to something. So always cool to see. Thank you for yeah. sharing that. Uh, we've got a lot of great questions that have come in from um, the audience. I'll also point out, we put in the chat, uh, besides the, the game card, um, information about the eBird app that we were talking about in the last talk. And uh, it might be worth it to check out because you, you might be catching some Starlings or some Finch songs, I think, with this eBird app. Um, our first question is about that visualization that you just showed. Um, can you do that same sort of thing for when the birds are singing as opposed to listening? And is it similar or does it look totally different? Um, yeah, so in theory, you could. Uh, I, I don't have that kind of data. We, we don't in the lab, mostly because we really focus in on on the auditory system, there's tons of great labs that really focus on the singing part. Um, I would love to see that in that kind of visualization for sure. Um, and so I, I think one thing that we do know, and so if, if we were to visualize it like that, I think what you would see is the auditory neurons would shut off. So what we do know is that while the bird is singing, much like humans, when we're talking, we're not listening. <laughs> so the same is true in birds. Um, uh, you know, it's not like he, he, he's, uh, you know, you don't perceive yourself as he, he is. There is a time in life when he's very carefully listening to himself sing. Um, and we think that what is happening is he's comparing his own song to um, a memory of his tutor's song. But, uh, I think in, in general, most of the auditory system is suppressed during, during singing. During singing. Um, That's really interesting because another question is these neuronal firings that you show, 
um, would they be similar to what we would see in a human um, anim animal that's learning language or babbling or practicing? Yeah, I, yes, I would, I would think so. And um, I think one thing that I'm, I'm hoping to get uh, to improve um, with just more data, so I'll have more to show next time, is uh, a, more of a span of the auditory cortex. And so kind of what happens is what I was showing you is uh, we're zoomed in on kind of a small part of it where um, cells essentially respond to any type of sound. And this is true of our cortex too. We have sort of an input layer where cells respond to most any type of sound. And then as you go through the processing pathway, cells become more and more picky. Um, so maybe you've heard of the, the grandmother cell. So it's a, it's a neuron that, I think it's a hypothetical, maybe somebody actually found it, I don't remember. But um, it's a neuron that's deep in the processing pathway and all it responds to is an image of your grandmother's face. It's so selective that it, that's all it responds to. And so we know that this type of like hierarchical pickiness uh, happens in humans too. Mm -hmm. um, and it happens, you, you were saying over time it changes, which actually- Yes. To, um, one of our questions, the neuronal patterns for listening to songs um, within the same species, do they change with the age of the birds? Are they more reactive when the birds are younger? Yeah, so, um, hmm, oh, okay, there's, yeah, there's two parts. That, that part's interesting. Are they more, um, uh, are they more like open to different types of sound when they're young? Yeah, um, I, I think so. I hate to give a, a solid answer on that. Um, but yes, I think they are more general. Um, but you could you could check out a paper from our lab that came out last year. Um, it was a culmination of a lot of work from our postdoc, uh, and he pretty much showed that in these higher up processing layers, if you take a zebra finch and raise him with a Bengalese finch, those neurons become more sensitive to or more selective for Bengalese finch songs than zebra finch. So you've taken a brain of a zebra finch and molded it into a Bengalese-like brain is the idea. Yeah. Um, it sounds like you need to catch one of those critical windows, those critical, uh -huh. critical periods happening too. Right. Actually, that, that brings us to a question about, because you mentioned several types of finches. So why is it that zebra finches are used over um, other songbirds? Is it like, is it a model organism? What makes it such a model? Um, well, I, I think maybe it was like, partly historical reasons. Um, and so I think the, the big ones are zebra finches, uh, starlings are one that are, are you know, kind of a, a model for birds and canaries are the other. And um, at least with zebra finches, they're really hardy. Um, they are easy to, they're, they're perfectly happy in a lab environment. They do all the things that they would do in the wild. They show no signs of, um, you know, distress in the lab. They, they breed, they play with things, they build nests, they're active, they sing all day long. Um, so I think one is that they're hardy and they're, they're easy, to, easy to breed and care for in the lab. And, and they also make really good pet birds. So, you know, people, they're really common. You can go buy them at the pet store. So I think that's part of the reason that people use them for science is they're easily accessible. It sounds like it um, would be a delightful lab to work in. Just going in and the twittering of birds. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Until it's been like eight hours and they haven't stopped. <laughs> haven't stopped twittering yet. Um, so speaking of some of those uh, very particular experiments that you can do in a lab setting, we have some questions about the tutored finches. So one is, do tutored finches have a hard time finding a mate? 
Mm. Oh man, I get asked this all the time, and I always yeah. need to like dig it up. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I can't really tell you because, um, I mean, I would imagine in the wild, yes, but I, I can't give you any, a solid answer because we we really, you know, in the lab we control their breeding um, pretty carefully, and so, I mean, I, I wish I could give you a good answer to that because I. I want to know that too, but nobody's done that experiment yet. Uh, I shouldn't say that. Maybe somebody has. Um, maybe you'll do it. Maybe you out there will yeah. do that experiment. Please report back to us. Yeah. I think definitely the birds that were isolated who never really learned a good song, from what I know, that they, they have a hard time finding a mate. So the ones that, that were isolated. So if you're taught by a tutor, you might you might still be fine. But if you're isolated, you might have quite a hard your, your chances might be better. Yeah. So uh, is there a difference in the actual development of those audiogenic centers in, in the brains of finches um, among finches that are not raised among male finches? Do can we see, could we actually see evidence that they weren't raised among male finches in their development? Wow. Um, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. And I think you could look at, there, there's a lot of ways to approach that. Um, okay, yeah, I, and I think, well, here's, here's one thing I know for sure is that if you, okay, so, like you said, there's a critical period for when you can listen um, and, and form a memory from a tutor. And usually that's early life. You know, if things are going normally, like, you know, in the wild, this typically happens, um, that, that your dad sings to you and you make a good copy. Uh, but if, you know, in the lab we isolate the bird, that, that window will lengthen. Um, so, so you can extend the critical period by not providing any input. So, so something is happening when you hear a song that, that sets off the cascade, you know, that, that drives changes deep into the brain. Um, so I, I'd imagine, you know, you could look, measure their neurons and see what, what they're open to, like, like you asked before, mm -hmm. maybe they're still more general at a you know, at a late age in life and their neuroplasticity is still quite open right right that. right it does close at some point um that extension, you can draw it out yeah that extension is really interesting i didn't mm -hmm. realize that so then the two songs um that you show that you measure uh someone's wondering what are the ways that you can actually quantify can you quantify how closely two songs are to each other yes yes we can definitely and um there's lots of ways to do it and we're always playing around with new techniques in the lab um but you're right it's it's kind of like a complicated uh there's not an easy like this is the number that that tells you how similar they are so often what we do is we'll look at like a syllable by a syllable level and um take every pair of syllables in two songs um, or every pair of notes and uh, you could use, use like it's called a cross correlation you slide the waveforms across each other and if they line up at a particular point then bing it's a good match um, you can also break down the the note or the song into um, measurements of its acoustic features like the um, like how how much how much spread of frequency is there in the note? How long is it? What's the gap the gap of silence between the notes? Um, what's the change in time of uh, change in pitch over time? So so we can you know get small measurements on all of those and correlate those two between songs. And I and and always changing it. That's that's very interesting. Um, we have about three more good questions here. The, um, the, the Waddington's landscape that you talked about and you connected it to biology or, or neurons themselves or context, 
Um, someone who's interested in genetics, are genetics involved in this landscape metaphor at all? Yeah, that, that's where it came from, actually. Yeah, so Waddington was a developmental biologist, and he was interested in how, how does a, a stem cell become a, a brain cell or a liver cell or a muscle cell? And it, it's got to be, you know, a gene expression. It has to be. And so he, he, was, he thought that, as, you know, stem cells in a human, say, have a landscape. And if, you're, if the cell is traveling down that landscape and there's some factor, you know, some transcription factor or whatever nearby that it picks up, it sets it off on, an, on another trajectory. And then these sort of, you know, these gene expression patterns cascade into other patterns that influence. So you get it into, you know, a cycle. Um, and so he thought that uh, it's the genes themselves that set the landscape and the protein products that, uh, or the protein products of the genes really set the landscape. So they, you know, they pull the landscape here and there. So, so if you're a stem cell and you migrate to the heart, you're in a part of the landscape that is heart. And so you, you experience the, the nudges that cause you to become a heart muscle cell. That's brilliant. And thinking back to the visual of Waddington's landscape, you showed, I guess, if you're a pinball wizard, <laughs> quite correct. Little yeah. for everyone. Um, how do you choose what areas of the brain to focus on? Oh, that's a great question. Um, well, I want to look at all of them, and I have a hard time picking. So the head of my lab says we're going to look at the auditory cortex, and I go there. But there is so much fascinating stuff there. Um, yeah, so you kind of, all right, compared to the size of the probe, the brain is huge. And so we have to make a decision. And we know that this, there's a, you know, this part of the brain, the auditory cortex, it's actually like a, you know, a little slab just in the back, but we know for sure that it responds to sound. And, you know, there's a lot of the brain that we don't really know what it responds to. And that makes doing an experiment difficult because you don't know what stimulus to provide, uh, you know, is it sound? Is it visual? Is it a combination of sound, vision, and color, and texture? Um, so we kind of go there kind of because it's relatively simpler. Um, is, there, is there a part of the brain that if you could just put an electrode in it, you'd, you'd want to know what was happening? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you want to keep it to yourself <laughs> um no there's okay yeah so mm, there's a okay so there's a there's a place that all right well in in the bird brain human brain yeah there, there's so much cool stuff going on in the bird brain there's a place way far up that's just this tiny little bean and it always, so we, we do some circuit tracing studies too, where we inject a dye and the dye travels and it lights up the, the, the circuit of wherever you inject. And when I go for the auditory cortex, I see this tiny little bean way up at the front that lights up. And there's like one paper on it from the eighties. We don't know anything about this thing, but it always pops up and it's in a, just a weird spot. So. That's the one. That's what I would do. That's, <laughs> That's always there in the weird one. I love it. So mm -hmm. here we have come to our last question. Uh, and I saved it for last because it's kind of the heart of the, the matter. Do we have any clues as to the actual information between the birds that's being transmitted in these songs? Yeah, so... Um... Yeah, uh, it's probably not, you know, messages like we're sending to each other using language. Um, but there is, the best we can tell is um, 
that they're advertising something about their fitness. So many, many different species of songbirds, they use them for different things. So like the zebra finches I showed you use song for courtship, the males sing to display to a female, um, lots of other, actually that happens to be an outlier in most species of songbirds, the female also sings. Um, and, and a lot of birds use song as a like territorial defense. So, so here's the thing about song is that the best songs are loud, fast, and complicated. And that's what the females like the most. That's what if, you know, another bird is coming into your turf and you sing him a loud, fast, complicated song, then he'll back off. Um, so there seems to be, you know, a variety of pressures for loud, fast, and complicated. Uh, and it, so based on that song seems to be a measure, like a, it's what we call a reliable indicator of fitness. Um, that you, you can't fake it. You have to be kind of healthy and strong to sing a song like that. Um, so, you know, a female can evaluate a male based on his song. So they're, they're kind of like Pokemon that they can only say their names, you know? So when the bird, I kind of picture the bird saying, he's like, hey, it's me, hey, it's me, it's me, it's me, it's me, it's me. And if he can do it really well, then they're sort of advertising themselves. I think that's, that's the evolutionary. You know, there's, there's a really great um, like short article called what does it mean to be a bat that like kind of gets at this philosophically. Uh, you should Google it. And um, he kind of says like, we'll never know what it is to be a bat because we can only think about what it is like to be a bat, like to be a human thinking about what it is like to be a bat. Um, it's kind of like a, you know, epistemological wall. But I love the question. I do too. That's mm -hmm. one of my favorite things to think about as well. Mm -hmm. Jacob, thank you so, so much for being here and for sharing that research and for taking the time to answer all of our questions. Thank um, you. I want to give a big uh, thank you again to both of our speakers, to Julia and to Jacob for taking the time out of their day um, to share their work with us. And if you want to um, learn more about it, actually, uh, Julia has a, um, a paper coming out. Dr. Zagella has a paper coming out about uh, watching birds on the street. Uh, and it'll be coming out in Scientific American on in the online edition on Monday. So um, please check that out. I can't wait to read it. Um, thank you also to you, our audience, for being here, for asking your questions, and to the whole New York City Taste of Science team, Catherine, Rosa, Dean, and Britter for making this event happen. We really hope that you enjoyed it. Uh, we want to bring you more always. Our festival um, being virtual means we lost one of our biggest sources of income like many others. So if you have anything you'd like to spare, we'd be grateful if you uh, found our donate button on the Taste of Science webpage. But also speaking of the Taste of Science webpage, here's a shout out to all the folks that have a festival passport and have been collecting digital stamps for attending multiple events. Uh, there's still three more talks coming up. So check those out and make sure you collect your one for this event. We'll post these talks to our Taste of Science YouTube channel so that you can watch them again. And you'll also receive a survey um, to get your thoughts about this event. And we'd love to hear your feedback. And I'll also say there's information on that survey if you're interested in volunteering with Taste of Science. It's an entirely volunteer run thing. And it's also how I made some of my first and best friends after moving to New York City was to attend one of these talks and then get involved volunteering. So I highly, highly encourage it. Um, Thank you again, Julia, Jacob. It's been a pleasure to talk birds. Uh, we hopefully we'll see all of you for our in-person events, maybe as soon as the fall. Here's hoping that the science brings us there. Thank you, have a great evening. <laughs>